Before we no, do, wait, do I, go ahead. I have um, chocolate munchkins I brought that are open. Oh, you don't want that on the recording? So, it's there yeah. now. <laughs> it's not even my committee, it's Carol's committee. Go ahead. Good evening. This is the policy review committee meeting on January 20th, 2016. At 6 o'clock, we're at the Daniel Boone Administration Building Cafeteria. Um, my name is Carol Bites. The other board members that are here are? Jeff Scott. Connor Kurtz. And from our administration? James Harris, Superintendent. Rob Hurley. Michael Miller. Thank you. Can we, and there are various members of the public here. And Mike Wolf has joined us. Can we stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, does the public have access to our agenda and the draft policies in the back, do you know? Do you want to join along? We were just discussing the uh, process that we're in with the policy review services from PASPA. For those of you who are not aware, um, Mr. Chris, could you give us the background on that? Oh, again? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> we, did, we talked a little bit about it, just informally, people who were before the meeting began. Um, this committee started five years ago to look through all the policies we had on the books and to recommend changes to the policies that exist in our current form, not to look over new policies, not to discuss potential policies, but to look at what we already had on the books. And when we began reviewing the policies, it was looking through the high priority ones, so it had not been updated since the 1970s and 1980s, the hot button policies. And then we came to the conclusion that, hey, it might be good to, to look at these going from 000 to 100 to 200, looking at them by section which we did, it turns out it's a very time-consuming and laborious task going through each of these to make sure that the codes are up to date and uh, the references. Um, so we decided a few months ago to contract with the Pennsylvania School Boards Association and they're pretty much doing the legwork and they'll send us the policies to review and if we like their changes, we can just pass them along as is to the full board for a first reading and then a second reading and final approval. Or we can make changes as we see fit to what they've recommended, provided that it doesn't conflict with any language from the state. Uh, okay. Is that a good over? Yes, thank All you. Right. And for the record, the life cycle of a pol the, the policies are how the board governs the district. It sets the Policies and procedures that are uh, created as a result of the policies are exactly how our administrators and teachers function in the day-to-day -day processes of the district. And a, a board policy cannot be changed without two public readings and chances for the public to comment on them. So we're at the very beginning of a process with a brand new set of policies today, the 100 series that we got back from PASBA, from the service. And I'd like to... Quickly, if the board has had a ch if the committee has had a chance to review them, there's seven of them that I thought were kind of ready to go. I didn't have any changes on them. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to direct you there and see how close we are. Much of the the language comes from the Pennsylvania School Code and from the USCC Code, and it's it's really incumbent on us not to change any of that language. So I'm going to suggest <coughs> policy number 100, 101, 102, 105.1, and point two, 106, 7, and 8 be discussed first. 105.1, not 105. Oh, just making sure. I did pull 105, yes. Okay, okay pull 105 too. Just for the sake of starting discussion 100, 101, 102, 105.1, 0.2, 106, 7, and 8. 
So why don't we start with your comments on any of it? Thank you for joining us, Mr. Wolf. Pleasure. <clears throat> well, the mission statement policy, I've said a few times, and there are people on the board <clears throat> who don't necessarily think we should even have a mission statement because it's kind of pointless. Um, how does it reflect what we actually do? It might be, I know back a while back they had um, these strategic planning sessions where they got a group together that was required by the state. It was, from what I understand, a bureaucratic mess just reading about it, uh, where the mission statement would be reworked, the district vision statement would be readjusted, and the shared values. I. Can I just ask our, our admins real quick? Did that come right from our comprehensive plan? Do you know? Is it that what our mission statement is, and wasn't that just done? It's, the comprehensive plan is the state requirement now of that. Use, it's not anymore. We don't need to have. Is that correct? Is it, we don't need to have a comprehensive. There's not. They just changed. Plan. Yeah. It's just changed the name. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it, can, it doesn't have to be done as frequently. I think it's it's a longer cycle. Five year used to be two or something. We did ours two years ago. It was, was it two years it's ago? Just, yeah, it was within my. Yeah, I think you were here. Yep. So I'm just assuming this is right out of that strategic plan yeah, I mean, that they put all the work into already. I wonder now what drives what. Is it the policy that drives what's in the strategic <clears throat> plan or the strategic plan that drives what's in the policy? Um, regardless, my solution to this would be, if, unless we want to keep it exactly the same way as it's been for the past, I don't even know how many years, but it might be nice one day to get like a small focus group together and just workshop the mission statement, the vision statement, the shared values, and see if there are any changes we'd like to make, any additions, any uh, anything that reflects. Uh, well, if I'm not mistaken, world. with all due respect, I'm pretty sure that was the process that Mrs. Kiesel went through because I was on one of those committees. Is that right, Mrs. Weber? That there was community input. Everybody got together what, to what, develop what was that this. For? Because I was on that committee too. I'm trying to remember what that was exactly. That was to create the. I, I don't the think it if was. it's not the same, it should be. But if if I'm guessing and I didn't. Because this never came to the full board to change. Yes, because the whole man manual was adopted. Not the 100s. No, the manual was though that had the um, the mission statement in it, not the policy. I'll have to look back for that. Um, so do you want to hold off on that until we? Just well, I'm just saying, if, I mean, the question would be if we want to make it, if we think that would be a worthwhile endeavor, if, if it already happened, I don't remember having the discussion about the mission statement, the vision statement, or the shared values of that event. Um, I think there was some, that's something similar I'm talking about for this. Yeah, I, don't I think, think there was, was a lot problem. of different focus groups. Yeah, I think that might have been. Mrs. Kiesel had that up on page. Yeah, I forget. Six different focus groups. Yeah, it was a huge, it was a. What was that for? What was the old copy? Okay, did that change anything in here? If I'll agree with you if in that if it's not exactly identi identical to our current comprehensive plan, then we should not move forward with yeah, it. I would so can we approve it conditionally tonight? And yeah, sure. As long as it is it matches yeah. what's in our because I don't see any PASPA workups on it that they changed anything. I'm fine with that. The, so uh, okay the other thing being matches. <clears throat> Are you okay with that, Mr. Scott? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, it, it, it feels like to me that the mission statement is really an optional thing, and it's more of, you know, do we want to set a higher arching goal for what the district wants to accomplish, not so much what the board wants to accomplish, right? So, I mean, yeah. unless there's something that's changed in the overall purpose of the district, you know, there might be some tweaks yeah. here and there, but, like, I feel like we're going to wordsmith it and not really change the the underlying mm -hmm. meaning of it in the, in the in Yeah, the I can't imagine ever. I guess that does speak, though, to mission statements themselves. Yeah, how, it's not like you would ever end up in do. litigation. Right, like we don't agree on what, how it's actually stated, but is the theme of what and the, and the intent of it is, do we, do we agree on that? Yeah, I think that's a question I guess I have for Mr. Mm -hmm. Harris. How does our mission statement, how do our day-to-day -day activities reflect our mission statement? Like, what is the interaction between what we have on this piece of paper and what we actually do as a district? I think we try to follow it pretty pretty closely. I mean, the words may change if we, like you said, wordsmith it, but I mean, our mission is what it states right here. Yeah. Unless we start doing something else. I just <laughs> yeah, I know, safe I, learning I, environment, diverse, dynamic world. If you look at it's everything that we've been trying to. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know what kind to. of answer I'm necessarily <laughs> expecting on that front. Um, I don't know. I, so I okay, well, this is probably the most we've ever talked about the mission state <laughs> bill in the past five years. It's a good point. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't certainly want to keep moving it along if it hadn't already been re just considered. I just want to make sure it has some. Like, okay. It's actually affecting so we'll what we do. I don't want to have a piece of paper that says something and then it doesn't go anywhere. I want what we actually do to reflect what our mission is, because I think that's what a mission should be. Um, just something, I guess, to mull over. It's, okay. I don't want to waste a bunch of time talking about it. All right, we'll move that one along then, as long as it, it is current with the comprehensive plan. Any of the other ones? 102, 105, I have a question on, on just 100. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Scott. Um, so each of these, uh, especially when you, when you get into the second page where it starts getting into the, uh, the various plans, um, like, who ensures that these plans are executed upon? So they all had some very specific plans, like every three years, every five years, every six years. Mr. Harris, can you speak to that? Where are I we imagine looking? it's, um, and we're talking about one, out, one policy 100. Per, yeah, policy on the mission number state 100. Plan. Comprehensive planning. I think it's already pretty much integrated right into our system with what Mrs. Kramer does. Uh, her regular day-to-day -day operations are all fa founded on. Well, so it's, for example, no. like I'm just going to in, um, into uh, the induction. The district shall develop and submit an induction plan to the Department of Education for approval every six years, as required by law. You do that. Yeah, they probably get notices so from the DEA. Yeah. It's time for this filing. Like on yeah, things that, on books, like yeah, things uh, expire the cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which is probably what they're very, very confident at. We've never gotten any trouble for not having these filings done on time. And we appreciate our administration for that. <laughs> the public library, it says that these... That did worry me. Are we doing that? Which one is that now? says, um, here we go. The plan shall be made available for public inspection and comment in the district's administrative offices and nearest public library for a minimum of 28 days. And it says that that's... Well, you know, that's actually It says question. optional, though. Well, that's something I'm wondering now. Is that part of the state requirement? Because it lists these for all these different plans, or is that just something that PASPA recommends we do? Because we had a similar discussion years back about our policy manual. Our policy at the time said that we need to have, we, we had to have a hard copy policy manual in every building. And that policy was written at a time when the internet wasn't as widespread as it is now. And now our policy manual is online. Mm -hmm. So we decided to take that part out of the policy. I would like to take that part out if, if that's if an option. Yeah. Because um, there is a note on the bottom from, from Adele from PASBA that said, there, she put some clarification on that. She said it is not a state requirement. Oh, what number is that? Wait, I don't want to. Where are we at? 100? Yeah, I'm out of order here now. That just seems like a lot of needless work uh, for our, our administration to, to print out a plan of changes and, and have it delivered to the library. And what's the nearest whatever. library? The one nearest the, to the, the middle area. school or the one nearest to. <laughs> yeah. To, I, mean, uh, I guess the answer, regardless of which building it's close to, would be the Boone area. Library, I would love to remove that ambiguous. completely. So let's uh, let's run that bypass. If a publication okay? requirement is required, I would try to see if we could do it online. I don't know if that is a question though for PAS, but if it has to be a hard copy, it has to be in a library. And that's on 100. What section? It's in every section. Oh, here it back. is. The language on making the plans available at quote the nearest public library is included in the official sign-off sheet for PDE's comprehensive planning tool, but Chapter 4 regulations only require the plans to be made available for public inspection and comment generally, okay. which then, would be here. Yeah, right? I would be say on file. If, they ha if it has to be for the strategic plan, then include that in the strategic plan section, but don't include it in every subheading. Not the strategic plan, PD's comprehensive plan. Oh, it's just an on-site, yeah. Okay, well then, list it for that So, So, okay to strike that if it's okay with the attorney? Yes. So if all of us? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Next. So in, uh, in number 102, at the very bottom of the guidelines. <clears throat> I, 
I, I guess my question is really more around is this, is this just, this is an addendum to the policy. We just didn't have this language in our policy before, but this is something that right. we do. Right, it looks like in bold it's supposed to be what their uh, pass was recommending. We add. So and then, of course, these are things we hold we hold ourselves accountable, or you know, we're, every we're, day. Held, we're held accountable every day. Every day, we just need to make sure we state it in the policy. The district's right. curriculum shall be designed to provide students with the plan instruction needed to attain established ac academic standards. The district shall assess individual student attainment of established academic standards and provide assistance. And students with disability may attain academic standards by completion of their IEP in accordance with the law. I mean, that's something we work toward every day, right? Yeah. yeah. But, it's just language that we just didn't have it. Right. We didn't Perhaps we could be litigated if we right, didn't right. make an expressed effort. Is that okay? I think we're okay with that then. Yeah, I just one or two good. Like I said, I just, you know, it odd. We're moving one or two. Okay. Yeah. I'd okay. Push on. One or five one or one or five two. Wait, we do one or five one. Are we gonna go one or three? Sure. Or, because there's sure, changes in all of them. Which one are you looking for? You're just going to go right down the line? One or three, yep. Oh. It's good. Yeah. Oh, I had something in the appeal procedure. It's just the wording, it, it, <clears throat> it baffles me. If the complainant is not satisfied with the finding of no violation of the policy or with the recommended corrective action, may I suggest we just change it to if the complainant is not satisfied with the finding of the investigation or with the recommended corrective action he or she may, blah, blah, blah. What section is this? Uh, appeal process, step four. So we're going through a process so how people can be, um, can handle the complaint procedure for non, for discrimination. Uh, it's page three, step four, district action. A finding of no violation. I had to read that several times. I just think it should be with a finding of the investigation. If the complainant is not satisfied with the finding of the investigation, which is referenced above, that you get you you get a, an investigation if you you know file a complaint. If the, so I'll read it the way I, I think it should be read, and you know, tell me what you think. If the complainant is not satisfied with the finding of the investigation, or with the recommended corrective action. She, he may submit a written appeal to the compliance officer within 15 days. Anybody have a problem with that? What are you requesting we change it to? Strike of no violation of the policy and insert of the investigation. <clears throat> Under district action, it defines so the investigation. Of the investigation. Right, we're talking about the result, the, the, the investigation, uh, the date to get a copy of it, and the, basically, if you're not happy with the, the findings of the investigation, It'll be the findings it's the findings. I think you'd have to strike. If you're going to change well, that, you'd have to strike with the recommended corrective action, because I would assume that there's a... Or yeah. the recommended corrective action. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of people aren't happy with the investigation. <laughs> right. Uh, trust me, they're not happy with the investigation, but it's... I think a you finding want to the of the outcome, right? no violation of the policy. Yeah. So if someone can agree disagree with the whole how the investigation was done. That's not what this is for the policy. Did you violate the policy? So if I'm confused. so, for example, if a if a teacher does something and the principal, okay, so let's say a teacher is accused of smacking a child and the teacher and the principal interviews all the parties who may have been in the hallway then the and finds that they say nothing happened or something did happen if the teacher who's accused says well you should have asked the other adults in the hallway or something you didn't do the you didn't do the investigation how I wanted you to do they could be what you're saying no 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 I'm still saying you you if they're not satisfied with the finding of the investigation, not with the, you think I'm saying with the, pro, with the, the investigation. Process. No, I'm not saying anything about the process. I'm just referring to the finding of the investigation instead of the finding of no violation of the policy. I mean, they either agree or disagree with the outcome. Yeah, there has right. to be. Is that what the findings are? The, findings the finding the is the outcome. Right? Basically, finding, did, you, did you not violate the yes. policy? Right. 
that's it. So, the, but the it just looks to me like somebody who's read these too many times. They got too mired deep in them. A no violation. That's just not common language for me. Well, I think the issue with the appeal, there has to be. You can't appeal an investigation. You can appeal an outcome. So you can appeal there be a fine, there being a fine, a fine of no violation, or I guess you could appeal the corrective action, but you can't. Appeal the, the investigation, you really right? You either, you either disagree that. that they were non-violation, or you disagree with the corrective action that was taken because they were found guilty of a violation. So I don't think the other. language that I'm, I, I'm proposing we change has anything to do with the, the context of the sentence. That do, or do you? Is that what you think? Well, I, I, I mean, to be honest, I think that any word in change, every word has a distinct meaning, and any change of words changes the sentence. Um, the question is, does it change it in a way that is better or worse? And I guess I'm... I, I think this is just, yeah. it's, 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 you know, as, as legal speak typically is, it's very specific, right? You yeah. either, if you agree with so you want no to, violation... I, that's fine. I do not want to spend a lot of time on no. it. You want to leave it a finding of, a no, I, of no violation of yeah. the policy. I'm fine with it. Do we, do we have a definition of what employee is? There is in the volunteer policy. I remember because we had a lengthy discussion about yep. that. Who is an employee? Because that wasn't, that's the one yep. question there's all I kinds of different one. employees definitions. And you know what, that goes back to talking about this whole process. We probably define employee a few different times in a few different places. Yeah, because this here, in the, in the front page under authority, it, it, it references designated employees. And then on the back, on the next page, it just, you know, goes to employees. So, you know, what's the difference between a designated employee and an employee? The designated one, yeah. that would be whoever is in charge. We have legal requirements to us. <laughs> well, this policy oh, changes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this brings in a compliance officer that has never existed before. This is a major change in how we operate, at least on paper. I'm sure there are... There's some form of appeal. Like right now, actually, Dr. Uh, Mr. Harris, or maybe Mr. Hurley, uh, if I lodged a complaint against, let's say, Mrs. Bites, she's a step, she's an employee, and I did, you had been conduct, or Mr. Hurley conducted an uh, investigation. And I didn't like the finding of that. I would write a letter to the superintendent. Yeah. That would just be my natural inclination. Mm -hmm. But now this is saying that there's going to have to be a defined compliance officer who all of these appeals would have to go to. That's which someone. That's good. someone in the district that would be assigned or designated. Yeah. So that it's role. a change in procedure, which is going to have to be disseminated among pretty much everybody in the district to understand how this is going to work. A link to be updated on the website. So just the only reason I'm saying this is to make everybody aware that there's going to need to be some new learning that goes along with the adoption of this new policy, the revised policy. But I'm fine with it. From, from looking forward. I'm, I'm just asking the question of. Do we, need, do we need to define what employee is or don't? We do that elsewhere in policy, so I don't think we do in this specific, I don't think we need to define this employee. This designated in employee is just referring to the designation. If you go a little bit further, it says the board designates the superintendent as the district's compliance officer. Right. So and they're again, just they, referring to that, that that's who you go to. You have to report the incident to the designated employee, and the designated employee is so-and-so. Like, if the designated oh, employee is the compliance cool. officer, then why not just say compliance officer? No, the designated employee could be also a principal or someone okay. in charge of that mm. facility. Gotcha. Right. Okay, so there's, there's a different level of designated okay. employees. You work your way through the system. Like, the first okay. designated employee would be the classroom teacher. I assume if there was an issue, and then the next one up would be the principal. Right, the people designated in this policy, right? And are we well on track for providing the training that goes with that? I mean, I guess that's all driven by PDE. Right. right. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Get a question. Okay. So that's one of three. When we're moving that one. I'm fine moving it. One of three. One. Non-discrimination. Qualified students with disabilities. You know, similar language. Reporting Very procedures, perfect. different key persons. Do we know the, I'm seeing a typo on page, of our packet, page four. There's just no space between not and superintendent. Yeah. Normally I wouldn't bring something murder like that up, but <laughs> how do we change that if this is, this is a new system? Maybe Mr. Wolf, you might know. We can let Mrs. <clears throat> Mrs. 
Kiki is assigned to handling the policies and she makes your your changes. I can redo that. I'll let her know. Okay. Yep. So just a notation for Mrs. Bites to make and what you want changed and Mrs. Kiki would take care of that. Thank you. Anything else on 1031? Um, I want to look through it a little bit longer. I'm just, so, uh, it's the whole employee thing. I just, are we, it's employees the same no matter, if I see the word employee, it's the same the whole way through this document. All the way through all of our policy. It's, okay. it, we do define, we define employee, this is a repeal policy. It is that we define employees. It's, it's in the volunteer policies too. Nine one four. I bet it's it has it be volunteers. They're employed. They act as employees. Coaches are employees. Obviously, right. so anybody paid as an employee, and then anyone who's volunteering for them are also employees for whatever that function may be. So we don't need to define it in each policy where employees referenced because it's as long as it's defined somewhere in policy. Yeah, there's probably like a state it's definition, fine. don't you think? If we ended up in law and court, there, there's a one federal of these, government definition. Of yeah, I the think IRS. Yes. we haggled over it. For if so we long. put something in that contradicted federal well, law, yeah, it wouldn't matter. Here, as we go through these, you're going to see like all these school code references. One of these is most likely what defines a school employee. Right. These two pages of references. So maybe that's a question. So you gotta go on a website and hunt it down. Well, so when they're hot the links, so I can stop asking. These are gonna be hot links no, when they get actually, out. When we're done, we, we had struggled with this too because you know, of course, we're, we're getting a static piece of paper, but the electronic version, you click on this is a this is a hyperlink that takes yeah. you and it gives you the whole definition. And, and I think we had one. Uh, there was one. I think it was like number one. I, I imagine. And, and we actually went back and asked Ms. Kiki to, to print out the, from the, the, from the website yeah. what that school code reference was. So I'm sure there would be one. Maybe that would be something you could request Ms. Kiki to find the definition of school code, um, school code sure. um, definition of report. Okay, that's one of three one then. We're going to move that along with the typo fixed. And just for our own uh, enrichment, we'll find out what an employee is. <laughs> How's that? Good? Yeah. Mr. Hertz? Yeah. 104? I had a question about genetic information. How do you discriminate based on genetic information? Was a type a change new? Can anyone, can anyone speak to that? Is this still on 104? 104, yeah. Board declares it to be the policy of this district to provide all persons equal access to all categories of employment in the district, blah, 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 or genetic information. I mean, we should know how not to dis discriminate against it if we, if we have it in a policy. I don't know how you discriminate against information. Yeah, like analyzing a hair on a brush or something and saying we don't want to hide. Oh, is that what that means, drug testing? That's not genetic, whether you take the drug or not. No, but they pick it's up your, your DNA. That's your genes, that's your that DNA. Yeah. It's your DNA. Is that what that is? I think we need some clarification. I'm sure that's Okay, let's hold off on that one. Yeah. Only for, and also on this one, uh, under reporting, step one, an employee or third party. Was, did anyone see definition of third party anywhere? I just didn't get, why did we start talking about third parties? Is that language that anybody's familiar with in the complaint procedure? An employee or third well, party? Just like anybody. You, if somebody be, comes it over. It could be a subcontractor that right. would come in here. It's and a contractor. Work. Yeah. Okay. A vendor, it someone coming in. It could be a student. In. It could be a visitor. Anybody who is subject to discrimination. In, in the employment and contract them. practice. Yeah. Okay, so that's just language. Them. That's just common. Uh, Genetic information. <laughs> ask for that information or some sort of genetic test when they are applying for employment, not like we would have to do that. Okay. I don't see that we have any. And, well, and if, if you're trying to find out if they're uh, predisposed to cancer or sickness or something uh, like that. Yeah, because yeah. they're talking about doing those things. Wow. Oh, okay. That's new. So, 
Any reason not to move that one along? Gentlemen? Good? I'm fine. Good? Okay. Other than, again, there now being a procedure that will need to be taught. I think the, yeah, that would be Mr. Harris, is it? Okay. Um, 105, I had a question. But are we, am I jumping around too much? No, that's good. 105. Uh, page 2, under authority. Continuous access for all students to sufficient programs and services of a library slash media facility. I just want to make sure that we, are we able to provide library slash media with all the cuts through the years? Or we, do, we, does that, do all our students have access to yes. continuous so access to a library slash media facility? Where does it say continuous? Number two. Please. Number two, I'm sorry. Continuous Throughout the school year, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like um, continuous. In my mind, would mean when the school is open, so is the library. And we are. The, the library is open. The kids can't go there unsupervised. Teachers can take them. There are times okay. where the library is not in a specific building because of previous cuts that have happened. Uh -huh. But as a teacher, the library is open. Library is always teachers, accessible the through the teacher. The good, library. good, good, good. Okay, that was the only problem I had on that one. Anything else on that one? Okay, Mr. Scott. And then 106 one. I have a question on, oh, 106 one? Oh, go ahead. What's the other one? No, no, no. I don't, wait. Where's 106? I had them out of order. 105 one, right? I'm on 105 one. I don't see a 106 one. Oh, no, that's 006, you haven't heard of that. Okay, so you had a question on 105 one. It's access to instructional materials. There seems to be a lot of references here. This is 105 one, the PA code. Um, never mind, I, my own question's answered. I just have to keep reading. I was going to ask if a parent wanted to come in and inspect a test the child might be given. Does that count as an instructional material? And it says here, for purposes of this policy, it does not include academic tests. Right. And that's because those tests that come in that measure our kids against the assessments are, like, hermetically sealed and very Well, I even meant, like, a biology test or something. Or oh. if I wanted to come and look at my kid's spelling test the day before they had to take the spelling test, would that be allowed in this policy? And it says here, no, it would not. So that was my... So I read that to mean that... Oh, you only meant that to read the state? Yeah, okay. Academic well, tests. Academic tests the, the academic assessments that, the state yeah. Stuff. yeah. You can't review them. Nobody can. Instructional, instructional materials, I mean, is that... That's any type of worksheet, handout, anything a teacher produces that's part of the... the any video the, the teacher may show. Yeah. <clears throat> so they're allowed to see it. They're allowed to take notes on it, but they can't remove it. Does that sound right, Mr. Hurley? Instructional materials would be everything used in the classroom. Mm -hmm. How about the um, request for the curriculum information via open records? Does, is that necessary? Can our, our parents just casually stop by and take a look at these things, or does it have to go through the the request process, the open records policy, whatever eight hundred one? I mean, if you're going to go ask your teacher, can I see this? I can't Private. imagine there'd be many instances where the teacher would say no. And, yeah, so this, I guess this would be there in the event that some teacher wouldn't allow a parent to see some type of, like, I mean, I don't know. I well, it's, what it says is request for curriculum information shall be handled via the open records policy. Where does it say that? Guidelines, guidelines, second paragraph. Does our yeah, I, I changed that shall, because that... Although that's curriculum, so that's a little bit different, right? So that's... Well, well no, I think that, it's... If I, I don't like the shell, because the shell, it compels a certain type of action. Yeah. And I'd rather change that wording. Like, if I, if I read this policy, if I didn't have any familiarity with the district, but I wanted to know what the curriculum was for 11th grade algebra, I would go for, I would file an open records request with the district for the 11th grade algebra curriculum. And that would take that, I mean, those open records requests, I mean, I know from experience, 
they take up a lot of time with the office staff and there's legal costs that go with them. I think the first thing, if you want a copy of curriculum, would be to email or send a letter or send a request to a designated person in the district administration. If that falls through, then you always have that open record avenue. But the first, I don't think really ever, the first option should be filing an open records request. There's easier ways to solve it. I'm real hesitant with that one too. If it's, if, it's, if it's accessible to the public, then why would we not just have it on the website and then see it? Well, when something goes through open records review, that it's screened by the lawyer and the, and the district to make sure there's any private information in, in, in what's being requested. My, my question is, what would be private in an open records uh, request for, I mean, in a request for curriculum? Right, yeah, there wouldn't be anything. And then, like I say, it just puts a cog in the wheel. Well, you know what? Yeah, I might be. In the I still don't think the first step is to go to open records. But that being said, I think there is a major problem with our open records process because even things that it seems from based on the practice of the district that we do pretty much always go to the lawyers, which always costs money, even mm -hmm. if in the estimation of our staff we don't need to get that legal feedback. We do anyway just to be extra, extra, extra safe. But that costs money. Well, I guess, I guess that, that's my that's kind of my point is <coughs> I thought open record was was a channel for for something that was it as is automatically public for public consumption meaning right you have access to see it but we need to look at it first right. before we hand it to you right that's right, right. like an email right. curriculum should be just like I, I should go on a website well, and click on curriculum sort of and just it, look at are we missing something I want. well the open record are we being naive law that. It defines what an open record it, or a record is, and it's pretty much any creation of government that doesn't have any type of privileged material. So even if something is available, like our minutes, our minutes are on the website, but that doesn't, they're, they're still subject to the open records law. Even though they're already available, they're still open records, and we'd have to furnish those if somebody filed a right, request. Right, or any presentation that was given in this forum, and we don't but that gets to one, store it anywhere, that people can... what we're saying. Where yeah, like anything that, that requires... A legal review before it's distributed is what's meant to be captured in the open records process. Yeah. Right. Anything else? Hmm. Well, you like? No. I, I, I can see your filings, our personal filings. It's not. It's it just it gets legal review to make sure. Like our district practice, it seems, is getting that review if there's any any doubt whatsoever, which I guess you should do. But Sandy Kramer, I spoke to her about this, and she's our open records officer, right, Mr. Harris? Yes. Just make sure I'm saying the right stuff. Uh, she'll get requests from copy, uh, copy paper supply companies asking for the latest, the last bids to be received on copy paper. And it annoys her from my conversations because all these companies we need to do is pick up a phone and she can provide that information. But instead, they send in these forms and there's a very strict legal process that must be followed when the district receives an open records request. Which gets back to why I'm suggesting we can't we can't respond to them via the phone. Not if it's an open records request. There's a certain prescribed way. Is that, that we can that we can, or is we that can come back and visit well, that. Want like to bring that, that up? Like some look kind of at that in committee. Some lawyer said, yeah, that's a good point. Hey yeah. guys, I want to make sure we cover our tails. Yeah. Let's make yeah. sure we go through the strict policy. Want me to put that on a, re a policy to review? That would be good. Just because and I move. think we need to have a discussion like, about that. That just seems silly to me. Like, that's a great idea. Yeah, maybe we are. I always kind of just assumed it was defined somewhere, but I never personally I saw it. I think it's a combination of there being some type of process code. and then our own practice getting inflated with that process. Yeah. And so how about um, for now, if, if we're all in agreement and there's no objections? I, 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 if you read the paragraph of, above it, and like you said earlier, Mr. Scott, if a parent or guardian student, district resident wants to see the information, it, it's made available. And I can't imagine a time where a teacher would say or a principal would say, I'm not going to show you this. Go fill out a form. Okay, so. so uh, Let's, we're going to strike that I just feel like out. strike that yeah. out, unless we're going to be more yeah. generic about it. Like, you know, or if, we we want, if you want to focus we can on looking, open records. Is right with that? Looking at the legal oh, citation, right. it only cites a district policy. It cites policy 801. It's not the state code. Yeah. So. I think we would have, unless there's something in 801 at that reference. And we'll put 801 on our... I don't think we need to include that. That might solve our problem. And, and that may just say you, you can't have any other student information in your personal information attached to that. So it says per that policy. And that policy generally is we strike anything that has another student's information or personal information in it that's not relevant to what they're looking for. 
I say we just strike that then if it's encouraging people to use the right to know process to request information that should be available to them anyway. I don't think we need to. Okay. Is okay to strike? I mean, just what was the just lawyer? This, the, the literal, it, it, it clearly includes curriculum in the above paragraph. Why is there a second stated line about curriculum? Yeah. Like, just get rid of it. Okay, remember the next process, too, as it goes through the attorney. So if there's any well, red flags if, about doing that's it. If, that's if open records. No, no, I'm saying this policy, this oh, practice yeah. okay. to the, today, it, we strike it today. It goes, what, Sandy will forward yeah, it to a lawyer and keep us from making any changes. That goes to our lawyer next. Are, are we still, right? is that the process? Well, you, don't have to, you don't have to send everything through, um, through uh, Fox Rothschild unless you're changing the substance of what this, what this is, which it doesn't sound, in, in, this, in this case, it doesn't sound like that's something you would necessarily send to them. Do you know if that's part of their retainer? And we discussed this it, before. Uh, Good, qu a good question. I know it's not Brian who reviews them. There's another okay. gentleman who does. Well, I say regardless of whether it is okay. or not, unless we are just changing it. Because I mean, PASPA's done that. That was one of the reasons for I, choosing PASPA. I mean, instead of striking it, shall could be turned to May. I think yeah, you know. that's right. a good it's idea. A it. it's, it's, yeah. it's a curriculum. And then if they get a hard time I mean, from somebody, they, they, if they get a hard time, they, they, they see that they will should know that you can get a hard time. I don't want to drive people to that process when there's an easier solution. I agree. But that is something to talk okay. about. Okay. So that's the whole pile of them. Basically, no um, subsidy changes, right? The rest are just straight up ads, right? What's that? Well, 107 and, oh, I'm sorry, 105, 2 and 106 are just full ads from ASBA. New editions. New editions. These are, yeah, I guess. These are policies we just flat out didn't have. Exemption from instruction. Yeah, because it's all bold. Yeah. Exemption from uh, instruction. It should also be that we have one that they just struck, that struck everything out. And I don't know. I can't get around here. That's the other possibility. Which, and you know, I, that being said, we were talking about how this is done before, and I think it's very helpful to have the, um, the policies as we have them now striking out, like with the strike through, what they're removing, what they recommend we remove, and then in green, what they recommend we add. Because some of these policies we did go through before and we changed them to make them more Daniel Boone specific. But that's probably asking too much from PAS when they have their own way of doing it. And you know, this is all pretty much straight from the code and they haven't figured out. I know I had asked that question in the format that they get it in is not conducive yeah. to, you know, to have the full word packet of, um, uh, of tools available for strike through or, you know, track changes, that sort of thing. Yeah, I remember all these questions coming up before. That's mm -hmm. one of the, I think, at least difficult things about serving on this committee because it seems like you've talked about the same things over and over again. Sometimes you have, sometimes mm -hmm. you haven't. It just feels that way. Not that it doesn't hurt to discuss it again in new terms, in terms of new... New people, new you know, changes, law. Okay, we good here then. I just want to one quick question mm -hmm. on the, quick. Um, the exclusion from instruction on the religious beliefs. It's one of one of five two. So, what about the situation where a student, in the in the midst of the instruction, feels like this is an issue? They they want to leave. It, it, it gets him to, to like it re-required written. 105.2? Yeah. There's nothing specifically stated about it. Most of it is, is geared around, you know, I'm, I want to excuse my, my son or daughter from this. You have to pre this, uh, for this reason. Pre request. Or, or yeah, I don't think you can review just review it and say okay. But if what if I'm in the middle of instruction and I, and I feel like this is uh, number three. Oh, there you go. They thought of everything. Actually, that, that is a problem. Number three. One and two detail what the process is for getting the kid opted out of a um, offensive test or instruction. Three puts the responsibility on that child to remove themselves at the right time. 
It shall be the responsibility of the student to request permission to leave class when the specific instruction object, objected to is presented. That worries me if we're talking about a first grader or something. Is well, that reasonable? The, the, well, the first graders aren't is, really is, tested, really. No, but if it's uh, something in the, the book that has something in that the, the parent wants the kid opted out of. But you really want to have a teacher in the position of telling the kid, listen, Johnny, you're not allowed to hear this part. And the teacher's judgment, should the teacher be the one determining whether or not this violates somebody else's religious beliefs? Well, I would think it would have been all spelled out in the request when the child is supposed to leave and when they're supposed to go back. It says where the child has to go, how we have to provide instruction. Well, I don't know how the teacher is going to be able to, to know everyone's hmm. religious I don't know when the child's supposed to know. To know it's a parent thing. And generally, if that happens in a class with a young child, <clears throat> the child goes home and says, hey, guess what I learned today? Right. Then the parent makes a call or comes into yeah. the school, speaks to the teacher, speaks to the principal, and then they're on out. They're made aware of it. And there's this, how many times where, you know, as a parent, you get a, a sheet of paper home that says, you know, this movie's going to be shown on next right. day. You know, you have to sign mm -hmm. permission or mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. permission exactly. to or yeah. to excuse themselves. Yeah, I think but three covers the I'm in the middle of the lesson and I'm not, I'm not liking what I'm hearing. Well, I, I want to ask to leave. I don't think it does. Unless, mm -hmm. it only in accordance with the parental request. If there's a request by the parent. It clearly says that that's, be, that's part of this process. If the parental request was completed there's that, is, and this approved, right, so it, it is not the responsibility of the teacher to dismiss the child. The student, it is well, the responsibility the of the... The question from well, his question Scott was, Scott was if I'm a student and I'm offended at the moment, no letter, yeah. Yeah. I don't no think that's letter. If there, then this policy doesn't address but that. It doesn't mm -hmm. address that. So if we want to add something like that, it would need to it would be a change from what was requested, which is fine. But also at what there's another question, does it have to be like if I were a sixth grader and I didn't really want to do this lesson, yeah. could I claim a religious yeah. objection? Where's yeah. that right Well, I mean, I, yeah. if that becomes well, a, it's like I got to go to the bathroom every 20 minutes. Well, sure, I'm not. If you address it, it becomes a, you know, obvious that they're just trying to avoid. Now, if the a kid's class. really distressed about a lesson, I guess it goes down to the guidance counselor, right? I just feel like there should be some yeah, option to, for the kid to say, like, I, I don't want to be here for this. Well, it sounds like it should it's be the responsibility here. of the student to request permission to leave the class when a specific instruction objected to is presented. Yeah, but keep only reading. with parental so request. When That's the only student seeks to be excused, the teacher shall excuse the student. Okay, so you've got a class if the, if if, the teacher or if. principal has a copy of a written request, well then they, you know, they kind of conflict with each other. No, it's step by student. step. It's explaining the process for opting your kid out. Saying, I mean, Same thing as the means keystones. I have to, as a parent, I have to write a letter saying if my son or daughter feels that any of the instruction violates their religious beliefs, beliefs they have the right to leave class and I'm okay with it. If that's what it is. Like a permit like an ongoing permission slip. That's possible. I don't know. Well okay. anyway, I don't I, I, that was my only ask was do we need to pr provide a provision where students can in the middle of the lesson just leave or, or ask for permission to leave I should say. I don't think we I don't need see to. why that wouldn't we work. could. I think that's within our jurisdiction, but we don't need to because Pastor would include that. I think it's already in here. Exactly what Mr. Scott just said. You could just put your request in writing that whenever this particular topic, because it says must detail the specific instruction from which the student is to be excused. But I think what you're saying is there's no pre-knowledge of what's going to be taught that day. Correct. And you're yeah, taught, and, and at home you're taught blue is right, and you get to school and they say red is correct. Right. And that offends you deeply. You're allowed to leave that or opt you're out of that asked. lesson. Yes. And the teacher should, you know, reasonably say, okay, or, you know, I don't know if there's a, go sit with the guidance counselor or go sit in the library or whatever it is for, until we're done. I'll sit in study hall. Or, or you're in high school. I, I'm just saying, I don't know, whatever the, <laughs> that, 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 that go visit the student So shall we amend this one? Uh -huh. Should we get some uh, language I don't know, I just, to include that? I don't know. It's just my opinion. I feel like if you're going to have this policy on 
I feel like it's more likely that I don't that know how occur. we would word it though, that, so that that would occur. It is that not the abused. predisposition of a parent to, to know that there's going to be instruction in my. Um, no, but what, I thought to your point, you were saying if this 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 X, Y, or Z topics ever come up in this class this year, please excuse I, me. I feel like that's what it says. And no, can't you do that? That's what it says. I'm I'm saying it says that like I have to give a permission slip that says if my yeah. my my child ever feels that. Well, we um, do. So isn't it covered then? Offended uh, due to religious beliefs, they should they have the right to ask the teacher for permission, mm -hmm. and I'm okay with it. Like they, I, I yeah. I'm okay with them asking. A way to accomplish that. Uh, I, I believe that's what yeah, I'm saying. I think that'd be it. Oh, I don't. From what I'm reading here, you have to have that note on file. If mm -hmm. I want to leave class, yeah. you have to have the note for me to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. To accomplish what you're saying, though, I think we can include a section. Saying now the way I would do it, if the student is under 18 and expresses like if I'm 17 years old and I don't like what's being taught in science, for example, I'd go up to the teacher and say, "Excuse me, I'd like to be excused." The teacher would say yes, and then I think a note should have to be sent home saying that Connor left science today because he had a religious objection. If the student's under 18, if the student's above 18, then the student should have to follow the procedure after leaving class. And he writes his, his own note. note. Writes his own note. How about so this? They'd have to do that anyway for the policy. How about we pull this one and just get recommendations from our administration? And I could tell you, in in my experience. If there is a family that has such strong beliefs in either direction, they will make it known to the teacher and to the principal and the folk and the powers that be. In my, I mean, I, I've, I've experienced this in different areas, and they make it known that our family believes in this way, and the students, up until about, I mean, starting right, right around fifth grade maybe, can explain their beliefs. And if there's an issue, it's usually well aware of, especially if they have siblings who have already gone through it. And the student they will know. leave. I get it. I get the it. student will be dismissed. Or we'll sit there, and teachers are professionals, and they understand the topics that they are discussing. And they also understand that the topics that they're discussing could be sensitive in nature to the students that they're in front of. So generally, a letter will go home if a, or a certain movies like if Schindler's List is going to be shown. A letter always goes home, you know. So I can't think of too many classrooms in the elementary grade where something's controversial. I mean, high school, the kids get into debate. But generally, this is handled with a parent-teacher conference before school begins. Principals, system principals are well aware of certain issues that are going on topics. When they get into the, the um, lesson plan this week, we're going to be discussing X, Y, Z. A letter goes home to inform the parents if it's of a sensitive nature. If someone doesn't like the color green and they're in art, that might be a problem. But if kids don't like it, high school wise, they can excuse themselves and explain it to assistant principal, guidance counselor, and That's then something's put in place. That's what I'm saying. The policy. It, it doesn't yeah. say that here. To, to make For that a student. Policy. Yeah. To just well, this them. is an exemption from instruction. This is not a disagreement with lecture. But if you want to put it, if you want to put it in there, well, we're saying, I guess, an exemption, a student-driven exemption. If something comes up, just for religious beliefs, just for religious beliefs, I think that's because I think in high school they disagree with everything. Well, that's what we were saying. So. That's the problem. <laughs> well, I mean, you have to trust that it wouldn't be abused, and if it is abused, then we go back and change it. Yeah. I can't imagine it would be. But. Um, really? I, I think the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to go out and like, you know, my son. okay, students, here's this little loophole that you didn't know about. Yeah. But if you want, you just say, I don't like this. I don't know. There should be a pretty high threshold for saying this is my religious class. belief. That However, if someone right, does it on their own accord, like I'm let's sitting here, I don't have, I'm a student. I have no idea about this policy. I just, I don't, I'm not feeling comfortable. And I go to the teacher and say, hey, listen, I, I'm not, I'm not really Who wants the language belief. amended on this to be more specific for students? Well, Let's vote on it. Are we pulling it or are we passing it? I think it's covered. Um, you want it covered? I think we just vote on it. You know, What's your vote? I think we should. I like it as I'm is. I'm all for getting, if, I think we should get some more, some wording options to see if we can okay. make it exactly We're just fit. To, do we need what to, we want. not to even need to amend this. Like, this feels like a separate, this feels like, as a parent, I want to make sure the school knows that I'm okay if my kid decides to, 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 to make an exception out of an instructor, but 
It's okay. High school. So we're going to pull that one and get some alternate word. So, so some choices before we decide. Yes. We're I just going to get some more uh, suggestions yes, and some weighing from the admin. That, that we could find that makes sense okay. and keeps us, but There's, isn't so doors wide open. Oh, wait, I have one more here. On 103, I did not like that the complaints were optionally oral. The comp on uh, step one of the investigation, 103. 103. 103. <laughs> 103 um, under guidelines for reporting. The complainant or reporting employee, and there's a typo there, by the way, is encouraged to use the report form available from the building principal, but oral complaints shall be acceptable. And that just really struck me wrong. We, if you're going to make a complaint, it should be in writing. 103. Yeah, the third page. Um, the third page in under guidelines for reporting. Complaint procedure, student slash third party. And it's in the other ones, too. The third too. line down under the third page. The complainant or reporting employee is encouraged to use the report. Student or third party, which why does that say employee? Well, you know, I remember this coming up. There's actually some real world effects oh, on oh, oh. how this is written. Because you, uh, I remember when I first joined the board, there were always discussions. Every, they said, and the superintendent at the time claimed that everybody knew who the, who the bad apples were. And we hear things all the time about them, but there has to be a written report in order for any action to be taken against a staff member. Um, so uh, I would like to strike it with that language in all three of them. I think it was in three of them under reporting. It would be helpful if there was Just no written. oral complaint shall be acceptable. Yeah, if there period. is no oral complaint, then the, the complaint, it needs to be instructed to complete a written That's what it complaint. says. The complainant or the reporting employee, which means if a student goes to the employee, well, I guess it, encouraged to use the report. To, is, a, is a oral complaint admissible in, in court? Should you go well, there now? I mean, when, you make, when you're in the process of an investigation, Mr. Hurley, and a student makes an oral complaint, okay, isn't it followed up then with a written um, a written Absolutely. statement from the child, so at that point it is a written document. But that's we're, not we're what this is saying. Right this is, we're running it down, we're asking them to This is saying that's exactly. optional, though. It says that the complainant or the employee who's handling the complaint is encouraged to use the report form, but oral complaints shall be acceptable. I, I think we should put must use the report from the... But they can't. Mm. Tell us. No, it says the complaint or the reporting employee. Okay. The employee go to they go to was supposed to document that complaint. Is this only in the context of reporting complaints to the compliance officer, this section that we're talking about? This is just in the reporting. It's, you know, it's part of the procedure. Right above they talk about the compliance officer. Oh, it does say if the building principal is the subject of the complaint, the student, third party, or employee shall report the incident directly to the compliance officer. Okay. So otherwise, the designated employee talked about before, it's the building principal. So the building principal or the compliance that's officer. That's what I mean. You're, you're, the oral complaint is going to turn into... Sounds you know, like we're already doing it. I'm just saying our policy should match our procedures. People who need to know that they need to write down oral complaints are the building principals and the compliance officer. As long as they're aware that it's their duty to write down a written complaint, or an oral complaint, excuse me, then we're fine. And I think we heard they're already doing that, right? Yeah. So can we strike it? The complainant or reporting employee must use the report form available from the building principal. Period. End of sentence. Well, that's not what I was no. saying. I, okay. I, the person making the complaint can do it orally, but it's on the designated employee, be it the building principal or the compliance well, officer. Isn't that what that it's says, though? It's on them to do the writing report. The it's report. saying if the it complainant is. doesn't, the reporting employee must. Uh, it's suggesting or it's encouraged to use the form, but I think what it's trying to allude to is that if you file an oral complaint, it's not going to be ignored because you didn't fill out the form. I think I'd like to say clearly, one or the other of you must fill out the form. So there's a there paper trail. There must be a form filled out. But, but, not, but you see, well, that's the, on the building principal or the compliance officer. It's on the designated employee to make sure that that form is filled out, whether it's themselves filling it out or whether it's 
the reporting employee or the complainant that fills it out. There must be one filled out, but going back to the oral complaint, the complainant has the, op has the option of complaining orally, but the compliance officer or the building principal should have a okay. requirement. Yeah, actually it does say that further written. down. Step three, the building principal shall prepare and submit a written report to the compliance officer. So it doesn't have to be written at that point. Okay, so we can leave that the way it is. It will be written at, at one point in the process. I'm just wondering what happens if there's a complaint that says there's a complaint against the principal and you just go right to the compliance officer. Does the compliance officer, well, I mean, if the compliance officer is at district headquarters, unless you're complaining over the phone, what other mechanism will you use to do it? I don't know. I, I think uh, it is from PASMA, too. I'm sure they've yeah, thought all know, these things I, through. Let's let it go. We with exceptions. Uh -huh. So I think <laughs> okay. that's fine. So we're good. Good? Sorry. Good? Uh, seven o'clock. Can we jump to um, begin discussion on the fundraising calls? Well, we still have on here 106. Oh, yes, and we need to do that one first. We need to do that one first. The, um, and then we have to do the 006, right? Is this like a a syllabus it's talking about, these course guidelines or the instruction guidelines. I'm not familiar with these in policy 106. Guides shall be prepared for all planned instruction adopted by the board. I kind of thought that was the lesson plan. Well, and, and in order to direct and assist the professional staff for the attainment of academic standards. So these guides are for the professional staff. They're not for the students. So it's not like a syllabus. Yeah, my takeaway was that this was continuing education for the basically yeah. the teaching staff. The or, I think it's I think it's just a basic yeah, day to day. It's admin, well, I think it's administration instructing <clears throat> the the staff why we're teaching this course, what is to be taught, what's the value of it. It's passing mm -hmm. that information down, which Absolutely. actually I think would be very beneficial because I don't think we have something like that now. I think it's you have a course and the courses are written by the, the teachers. And they're evaluated by the teachers, and the, through the curriculum writing process, hmm. maybe Mrs. Kiesel gets a say in it. But it would be helpful because we're, we teach these courses for a reason, and to have why the objectives, the concepts to be taught, all that passed down, I think that would be very beneficial. It's just lesson planning, is it not? Is, is it, Weber, yeah. is lesson that planning. something that already That's occurs? We have. Yes, the the guides. Thing. We don't know what the guides for planned instructions. Yes. This is. So it's what's past lesson plans. Guides and lesson plans. Guides shall be prepared for all time. Yeah. Guides shall be prepared. And there's some level of conformity of all Absolutely. Those. So yeah. it seems like this one is all right to me. Kind of sounds like the uh, manual, the handbook, the high school handbook, how it just describes the the course, what they'll learn, what the, what the criteria is, prerequisites. I'm okay with it. If you guys are. I'm fine with it on the condition that I mean, if we add these new courses at the high school, for example, the two new advanced placement courses, according to this policy, there shall be a new guide, there shall be a guide drawn up for those courses that articulates whichever yeah. of these may be appropriate. That's and something we're working on. Already. I just want to make sure, yeah. like, if I, because I'm curious if we have that. Do we have that for every course? The curriculum, through what they write the curriculum, we have to double check the format that we currently use for okay. the curriculum to be submitted out, but every course should have a curriculum okay. written that is going to approve that edition. All right. Because I'm still wondering what an actual, we asked this a few different times, Mrs. Bites and I on the curriculum committee, what does curriculum look like? Yeah. Like if I were Sometimes to file a right to know request curriculum. asking for one of these guides, I'd like to know, it, it would be a piece of paper I'd get back, but I, I'd like to see some of that at some yeah. point in the context of the curriculum committee, but that's a different one of those, uh, right to know for. Right to know for. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying, what would I get back if I filled one of those out? Would it be a piece of paper? Can you bring us a on? sample of, <laughs> yeah, like of like the curriculum guide for the next meeting? Anybody? We'll bring a curriculum. 
Okay. I think I saw it once. I think they had it once. You brought it once, yeah. Okay, so we'll pass it contingent upon the board getting to, the committee getting to see. Well, I think curriculum. we can pass it regardless. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's just a different discussion. So I'm fine with that. No, you're looking at 107? 107. Yeah, the only question here under authority, no planned instruction shall be taught in district schools unless it's been adopted by a majority vote of the full board. How do we adopt planned instruction? Is that through... There's never a, an up or down vote. Isn't on, that when the manuals get approved? What, when the course selection guides get approved? I, maybe that is what it is. That's it. Wouldn't that, that be the it. planned instruction? Well, we for only each do school? that for the high school yeah. and the middle school. Are we getting that for all our schools? They don't have courses to choose from at the elementary level. That's a good point. Level. We should be seeing the. We, at the very least, yeah, there should be something drawn up for the board to approve or not approve. What does that mean if we don't like? I mean, how did the current curriculum in the elementary schools get put in place? It doesn't come to the full board. That's a good point. To to yep. this. I don't know the answer. How they do it I'll make a request school. that we get copies of the planned instruction for the other schools. Mr. Hurley, really, do you have any say in that? In this one of the schools territory, um, when instruction is drawn up for the elementary levels, is there board involvement at any point? There, there, historically, there has not been any involvement, but it certainly is something we can do. Okay, I think there it needs to, according to it. At the very least, this policy says it has to happen. But it's referenced, it references four different citations, three of which being state code. Mm -hmm. So I think that needs to happen. But if we need to get further clarification on that, we could, I guess. Yep. But that's from good, what it looks like That's a good point. I like that. Needs to do it. I didn't think about that when I read it. I thought we were seeing them all. But we're only seeing the high school. I mean, that was a good point, though, on the high school, because I guess that course selection guide does Is the planned instruction. Okay, good. 108. But we can even or delve what? down into, <clears throat> into those courses, and if there's something that we want taught that isn't, we could Yeah, we could have fun in committing taught, that. Or we sure. could say that something should not be taught. I think Mr. Harris will make sure these things run out. That's interesting that that doesn't, isn't and we do. In we do want to go above and beyond yeah, absolutely. whenever we can. So. We can. Yeah. Right. I, you know, just one more note on this mm -hmm. poem. It would be interesting to see how those sections of Title 24 conflict with what the State Board of Education says, because it says in state law that the board it, the board has the obligation to approve or not approve what's taught or what isn't taught, then how can the State Board of Education tell us that you have to teach, for example, Common Core? Now, I don't think there's any groundbreaking legal argument to be made, because I'm sure it would have already been made, but that's just something interesting to consider. If this is what the state code says, that the rights reserved to the board, then how can that right be assigned to a different Oh, yeah, yeah, I hear you. It's just that the board has to make sure we're compliance with, compliant with all state regulations, so it takes us right back. It just takes you right back. Yep. It. It's local control, not really local, local control. It's local control to make sure that you're following state federal guidelines. Good on that then? Yeah. 107? Yeah. 108? Just making sure that we're still doing that, approving. We've been doing it now. I mean, we've made a, a big Got push that we have book. to approve all textbooks. Uh, that needs to just continue. And it also, I like that it says we have to have a planned cycle of review and replacement. You know, I, I don't know if this is really um, something substantial, but perhaps change it to and or replacement instead of review and replacement. We can review a textbook and determine that it doesn't need to be replaced. Yep. But this, there could be some, I think there's a little bit of ambiguity. Yeah, that's good. That's a good idea. And it's reviewed. Help me it's find it. Replacing and selecting textbook. Which, yeah, actually, no, what I think it's saying is that the plan cycle. Question, why would the board 
if, if Mr. Harris comes to us and says, here are the textbooks we want to use, like, why would we vote them? No. Cost. Cost is Cost. a big one. The other, and this, this has happened in other districts, there could be objections to how information is presented in one textbook versus another. Or if you've gone and reviewed the one textbook, but it's so insignificant changes from the one you have, it, it, you know, it, Can't justify it is, it. Right, is the difference justifiable you know, for the cost? That was another reason I heard you know, from the past that we uh, questioned it. The various additions that. come out each year, so is it worth it? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, that's the whole, you know, plan and review period to make sure that we're... Because these textbook manufacturers are in the business of selling textbooks. Uh, yeah, right. well, everyone's, so, the whole world is on this yeah. replacement thing. You get a new cell phone every year, why not get a new textbook? It's so interesting, just, though, in the 000 policy, I believe it's 000, the board can only override the superintendent's recommendation and purchase... If the board does not yeah, have the superintendent's recommendation, you need two a two-thirds vote, vote of board. to buy books. But with the superintendent's yeah, recommendation, it's only a majority vote. That's one of the few interesting areas of... of I just feel like, you know, I don't know, like, how much do we really know about a textbook that we can sit here and say it's... Maybe that's why it's two-thirds vote to overrule. And that, yeah, that like must like be the thing the, the board has to be pretty right. darn serious about it. Mr. Hash or read it from cover to cover. Uh -huh. and Absolutely. And make a really good recommendation. Cliff notes. No doubt about it. But well, again, on this policy, we need to, um, there are a few things that we're going to have to do. We have to have a list that's updated annually and it has to be available to the board members, staff members, students, parents, and community members. So I think we should publish that online. I think the goal, I think we should mm -hmm. do it in the public information section or wherever we have. A spreadsheet saying that these books will be used 11th grade algebra we're using yeah that'd be great um, this text in the interest of total transparency and i mean i'm just the reason i'm saying that is because this policy requires that we publish that we do the list that we anyway. have a list and provide yeah. it and furnish it on the recommendation or on the request for many of so what happens to the books that we deem as like we say there's a new edition and we get rid of the old ones what do we do a lot of time the um publishers will buy them back for a credit it keeps it in the cycle. Mm -hmm. Some books get destroyed, thrown out if they're antiquated or old. Well, they they yeah. buy them back, so Sometimes. you can't sell them to someone else who will determine mm -hmm. what right. they need to buy them. Mm -hmm. Well, they'll sell them it's somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to see. There's, it, it would be nice if we could figure out. Now, we have to go to Wilson and buy their year old books at yeah. a discount. Mm -hmm. We'll just stay one year behind. But we'll... I don't want to see us go destroying any books. I'd rather, if we're going to throw a book away, I'd at least get option to students, hey, we're going to get rid of these. If you'd like one, you can have one. I don't want to see us destroying any books unless we have to for a contract or something, but that's just my own, um, my own view on that. But going back to just one more, the authority, I think I'll be done on this one. The board, the board shall establish a plan cycle of textbook review and replacement. So that's kind of what the curriculum committee has been asking from the administration now for a while, and this is Kiesel. We'd like to see, and we got this curriculum review plan that I still think is pretty confusing. Um, but that has to, mm -hmm. I don't know when that needs to happen after the passage of this policy, but I think it needs to be a priority. If there's something mandated that the board do in policy, can we say, can, agree. can you write into that? Or you want to do it every three years or every two years? Like, what's the, what's the right? I mean, some I mean of the other put it into the policy itself. If you want I'm to. just saying, you want to look at it every year or every two years, whatever the, I don't know what the right. I think, well, you know, I'm hesitant to yeah. make any change to this section only because it references three parts of the state code. But that, it, as long as we're not required in any of those statutes to, to do something, then we can incorporate that in policy, I'd say. But I, I'd like to check those references one to one. So we leave, it, we leave it open, and then at what point do you say we want it done every three years? And how does that get executed on well, if you decide later, I want it every three years, do I, I think have to, the, have to amend the policy or do I? When we pass these policies, the, book, the administrators will be developing yeah. guidelines. And like, what is Mr. Harris and his to be in compliance with these? Is the right amount of time well, well, I think that's what we'll get from them now what once we pass the policy. What it says is just a planned cycle, so we can make yeah. that cycle whatever we like it to be. So right. we can review it every three well, years. I'm board. saying 
have to like, I would determine that shit. I mean, for me, I'd say... But know, we present it to you, and then you vote. It comes vote. from us, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. You say, hey, we yeah. think we should do this every three years. Right. Okay, then... Let's right. Live. We present it to you the cycle okay. that we propose, I mean, and then the board approves it. something like that, because that's been one of the things we've yeah. been requesting now for a while. That would be great. So just making sure that... It's, it's followed just, up on yeah. point. But I'm good. Okay, Mr. Scott? Yeah, yeah. Shall now, do I do public comment on the part that we did? I would like to do, yes. What was the disposition with 107? Are you moving that forward as well? If you could actually go through and just say for each of these policies, if we're going to move them, hold them, I think that would be helpful. Do you have that, Mr. Harris? <laughs> Do I have 107? Uh, all of them. They, we should go we right through them in order. Yeah, and we're, we're done. We went through all of them. Well, what, we're, what are we not moving for? Mr. We're moving them all. <laughs> yeah, I have all K. 105.2 was not because that was the exemption from instruction. So hold 105.2. What else? Add wording. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah 105.2 105 102. was add wording for without. What was 107? We want it to be I have to because I have to know which ones they are. They're twos. I didn't want to pick up my threes. It would be too big. <laughs> Like it's, well, it's like a flying dollar. I just can't help it. Yeah. It's like um, Tommy Hilfiger, you know. I got you. I'm there. You I'm walking. Way, I guess. No, it's trucking. I do have some of the policy yeah. No, we, I have this as going. 107 is, 107 is going, yes. The first year. 107 oh, okay, the question right? was about the instruction at the elementary level, the approval of... We just want to make sure that the administrators yeah, follow through. Yeah, we just did a caveat for the administrators to make sure we got, we get well, the plan of instruction in the future. Is, you know, we are working on the agenda. If, uh, you know, we have placeholders for these on the agenda. So oh, right, right. Sooner right. An we're, we're fine on that, right? We just are, are, we're just yeah, directing just our administrators to make sure that we get the plan of instruction. We don't need to change the policy. Who would be the best person to get an answer that? Me. Okay. Good. And then, and then 108, we're good with, we just want a recommendation from the administration to say we, we think you should do it, we should review the books every X number of years. Yeah, they're going to establish a plan so they can the review for us to, uh, to approve. And then there are changes in a variety of policies that they just need to be communicated. You got that? Yep, I got those, the typos. For and, example, uh, and then 105, and we took out requests. But nothing that has to come back to us because we have it. Oh, yeah, that's one I brought up earlier. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I mean, there were spelling errors. I just, I, I have a, it's a pet peeve of mine that we're a school district. We yeah. shouldn't have spelling errors. Yeah. We take our kids I got them. I, I got them. My wife corrects my spelling all the time. So comments from the public on any of the items we discussed? Okay. We didn't discuss any old business yet. Yeah. The way, let me just share with you the way that I structure the agendas, if it's of any value at all, would be in the order that the meeting would go. So I think that would be helpful for the members of the public, too, to know what, where in the meeting the discussion of the topics relevant to them would fall. Um, well, the thing is that when we get these, this bulk from PASBA, yeah. my inclination is to move them along. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's good. Just put that first on the agenda, then. Like, move, instead of having old okay. business, new business. Uh, just do new business, old business? I like listening to them chronologically, because I think that flows okay. is more of a natural way to, okay. to run a meeting. But it's up to you. So it's like when you were a kid at church and you're just following along to see where you're at during the <laughs> how many more songs yeah. Yeah. More, do yeah. I have before I get to go. <laughs> okay, well I did want to jump around some more though because um, <laughs> I wanted to finish up this teleconferencing uh, policy. And I don't even know where this policy O one one come from. What's, do you know what that, that is? Was, I, that Why is that was the board member code of conduct that we discussed that I said I didn't like. Um, it, it was kind of just a statement of values, almost like a mission statement. Um, well, I, it's, it's not under still under review anyway, so. Okay. So we're, all right. It's not in the packet, right? No. Okay. And what were we supposed to finish we, we up on teleconference? Yeah, we did. We took, we pulled out of there, like, some of the fluff. There's a lot of fluff and, you know. 
pop and circumstance that didn't need to be in this policy, in, in the one of, of the 06 policy. And the, the CIs were supposed to get back to us on something about the teleconferencing. The uh, This uh, confidential secretary. Oh, okay. CSs. <laughs> Talks about curriculum instruction. I'm sorry. Um, does it, do we know what that is? I don't remember. We asked about a definition of the term. We couldn't drill down on it. Yeah, this is, she, she attached a copy of what that was. Section 407. Section 407. The last page in this, that's yes, the right here. When she clicked on the link, they, they printed out this paper. No. Uh, what that definition oh, Section 407, Rules and Regulations. Each board of school directors may adopt reasonable rules and regulations for its government and control. Is that really a state policy or a state rule? That's tied into the teleconferencing policy we were trying to get through. Yeah, so when you see one, that's where That's the that's um, footnote to one. So does anybody have any problem with the policy knowing that now? What was the change? I can't find my, my piece of paper. I don't know. We, we had asked oh. what that hyper, what the what hyperlink was. Number one was. Yeah. Okay. So I had asked it. them to, you know, print out that hyperlink, which is the third page of this. It's attached. Did it change what we were talking about? I can read, the, I I can read it, it in context. Yeah, it's it very generic. Yeah. It's very generic, yeah. Oh, yeah. We don't need to talk about that as far as I'm concerned. I'm good. Okay, and then we decided that um, all the board meetings were voting meetings, so the number would be half of all the school board meetings we had in a year, and that m the administration would be the ones who counted that, kept track of that, right? Can we move that one along? Sure. Comments from the public? Oh, here it is. It's right in front of me. It's a mess. <laughs> Any comments from the public? Okay, I wanted to move on to the fundraising policy. But it's big and we only have 10 minutes. So what I would like to do is get comments from the public before we deliberate. And we'll, and we'll take the, um, did you get the email I sent out, the draft composition of a I got fundraising email. policy? I, I just sent it a couple hours ago. But so it's really it not. It's an attachment, but I didn't see an attachment. Oh, well, that's good. Maybe so why don't we take, is that all right? Can we do that? Can I take public comment? So, yeah, and then, I mean, we'll, then we'll the, read. The policy for committees is that public comment falls within the discretion of the chair. Okay. So you can operate public so comment. So anybody have uh, any comment on uh, the fundraising, the student fundraising policy that will be re, re, will be tweaking? Just to, can I? So just need to state your name and address. Like, Thank you. I would like to give a little background on that, um, where we're at with that. May I? So. About a year, year and a half ago, we found that our policies had conflicting regulations regarding fundraisers, fundraising purposes, personnel, money management, authorized purposes, purchases. Um, the booster 915 conflicted with the fundraising policy 219, the policy for volunteers, the wording all contradicted each other. Extracurricular volunteer versus a coaching volunteer. Um, the board also at that time felt that perhaps the fundraising experience, recognizing there is an educational benefit to students in fundraising, in financial and economic lessons, but we, it, it became to our attention that it was maybe too rampant, putting a stress on students, parents, and businesses. So the committee decided to address the problem bite by bite. Last year, in March of 2015, we, passed, we fixed the booster policy. Became terribly. What, what we did was we, we made the booster policy more tie into the spending end of the equation instead of trying to put spending and um, income into the same policy. So the booster policy 915, it's out there. It's very straightforward. We really simplified it. I'm actually kind of pleased with the work we did on that policy, and we had a lot of input from the community. So right now we're in the process of following that that process that uh, policy, and the booster groups are reporting to the business office. They're 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 presenting budgets. And they have the free, they're free to craft their budgets within some constraints, you know, basic general constraints that the board has. Um, the board stepped in to its role from, from the school code 511, which says that the board of school directors in every school district shall prescribe, adopt, and enforce such reasonable rules and regulations as it may seem proper regarding the management, supervision, control, blah, blah, blah of school. 
program, including the raising and dispersing of funds. So we tread the line there. We spent a lot of time. We didn't want to tell the booster groups how to spend their money, but by the same token, we had to make sure that, that what, we had to give them guidelines for what they could and couldn't spend money on, and it has to be reported to us so that there aren't conflicts with Title IX, the disparity in spending, because it really doesn't matter who spends in the end. We have to report to the state that boys and girls are being spent on equitably, right? So we reached into that policy to try and um, have some cohesion with the, the booster groups. So um, the booster groups are required to have their own management rules, bylaws, and again, with some of the board limits in the, pol in the policy. They, um, and there are triggers for them to report. So now where we're at is we've begun to gather some of that data from the reporting that was due at the start of the year from the business office, and we took a good look at the spending. And Mr. Miller, do you happen to have copies of that report, at least the summary page that we can distribute? Because that's where I would like to start the discussion, so if everybody can leave with a copy yeah. of that, we see what the groups are actually spending their fundraising funds on. I and, I'll be back. Okay. It's, become, it's becoming kind of clear that there are things that the district, that these, these booster groups are buying that they really shouldn't be when you consider that um, the booster funds are supposed to be spent for the, for the benefit of those children in the group that year. So they shouldn't be making long-term purchases, with exceptions, but ba basically we, we, uh, we're starting to look at that business office and a couple people in district are looking at with me and saying, boy, if we can pull back to the district, and, and last year's report it came to about $36,000 where we pay for the, con the equipment, the conditioning of the reconditioning of the equipment, any major upgrades to the fields should be the district's responsibility because there's liability issues with that too. And then the whole uh, fundraising problem comes back into a line where it could become much more civilized where the kids are, are fundraising for spirit wear and, you know, a trip or... Um, you know, maybe a meal or what else do they, where they can stick to fundraising in, in a much more, yeah, you know, you know to My approach here toward the whole thing is that it's a district's obligation to provide what they need to perform their sport or activity. If they right. need fields, we provide the fields. Right. If they need balls, Transport we provide Exactly. Balls. And we found we that some the of these groups were not. They yeah, had if they want to have a dinner, they pay for the dinner. Exactly. Right. But we were to, finding out that I think the baseball team or softball team or maybe both, you know, they, they were buying their own baseballs because you right. obviously you right. So this is the time now in this fundraising policy for us to put the final touches on the whole district-wide package. Yeah. Well, if we control how I was having a conversation with some how folks. money can be brought in now the income side. We now we reg, we're going to govern how funds can be brought into them. We've already governed okay. how they can be spent and the reporting requirements. <clears throat> so if we if we say Doesn't now that fundraiser have a targeted purpose. Well, that's what we're talking about. We would design the form that goes, I'm make sure it's compliant. Yes, there is right now a 219. It's just inadequate. You should have 219 there. Yeah. And there's a form that goes with it. It's just inadequate. Does the form say where the money, like, I have no idea what the answer to this is. Actually, I think I do for a, for a fan. We would raise money. It would go into the Music Boosters general account. It wouldn't go necessarily toward... X expenditure or Y event, it would go into, it's like the taxes, they come in and they go to the districts. Some of the fund. groups have activity well, funds and remember, they actually you have. you had your own yeah, personal have, account. Accounts. And then say you needed to buy dingles, okay? Yeah. You could take that, those are fan shoes. Okay, um, thanks. The, um, <laughs> you could use that money that you fundraised to pay for those shoes instead of having your parents write a check for it. But the other like 90%, like that, like we get, I think ten percent on each. If we raised ten bucks, a dollar went into our account, and ninety percent went to the music boosters. When that nine dollars hit the music boosters, that would just go into their general account, right? Right. From my understanding of Mr. Scott's question, like every fundraiser having a purpose, to me that's the purpose is tied to the expenditure. So we're raising money for X. We're not raising money for the music boosters. We're not raising money for right. softball. We're raising money so we can go to And that's where we want to get at with this policy. Okay. We want the fundraiser to specify what they're, what they're going to be buying with it. Okay. And what, um, and it should fit the... Well, I think that addresses some of your complaints that you had earlier about these fundraisers out the wazoo, to use a Mr. Basil term. Yeah. We have a fundraiser Surely not mine. We have Let the record show. We have a fundraiser for this. We have a fundraiser for that. 
what, well, they're competing. Exactly. Too. And that's the goal here of this of a good a well crafted policy. Board, administration, public, so that we can we're, we're fatiguing our students, our parents, our patrons, our our businesses. Everybody's it's just fatiguing. And well, we want to put, just put the rain on it right here. If I'm supposed to go out and raise money for something, I want to know where that money is going to go. I don't want it just to go into some to some fund that could be used for whatever. I want, it, I want to know that I'm getting something. And by money. the same token, I want to say that I think a good fundraising policy would would have that a co-curricular fundraiser did not, was, did not apply to the limits. If we put limits, what we're thinking of doing, what some of us are thinking, let's n limit how many... Uh, fundraisers a group can have in a year, and let's limit the scope. And what should that scope be? These are the discussions I want to have. And then, um, if you're a seasoned sport, you should be restricted to a seasonal activity. You should be restricted to maybe two fundraisers. Just throwing things out. Okay. But a big, like a, mu a music booster group, that is multiple groups, and all year long they would have access to more, you know, a longer time for. And it would all be uh, approved by the principal. Well, you know, if it's but co-curricular would always go through their principal. I don't see a need to put any limits on it if it's going to be approved by the principal because they'll use their judgment. For example, I, I remember when I... Well, you did, could do that. You could just do it in guidelines. Yeah, when I did T-Ball or whatever, we had the Wawa hoagie coupon sale. That didn't require much effort at all. If somebody wanted a hoagie here, buy a coupon, we get a little bit of the money back. Would that count right. under your proposal as a fundraiser? And that would, that would be one of their two that they could use? Well, like, I'm, as I said, I'm just throwing sure, numbers okay. out. What can they, they I'm need to raise for two to four. Like that, we're figuring no team should need to raise more than $4,000. If you're not paying their, yes. If they're not, if we're gonna pick up their equipment. I think so Kelly. please, tell us. Tell us who you are and. My name is Kelly Hefner, do you need my address for this one? I, we do. Please. Okay. It's 107 Oxford Drive, mm -hmm. Douglas. many of the issues that you just brought up, Good. but you really threw them all out at once, so I'm going to do my very best. Okay. Let's start with why there was so much funding. So about six years ago, the district took back a lot of the money that was given to sports. I can speak to sports. I know that you can speak much better to music, so I can only speak for sports for you. Each team gets about $100. Actually, I think they get $100. That is for... Okay. Thank you. That is for everything. So that was done, and I'm going to go with five, six years ago. You might know that better than I, but that's only the experience that I can speak from. So through that time, over these five or six years, the equipment and the uniforms and everything like that has clearly deteriorated. It has a lifespan. You have $100 to spend on each team. I will take baseball. That does not cover our baseballs. Each baseball is about $12. If you look at Optimus Field, behind... There's a lot of woods and stuff. There's a ton of foul balls that we lose. $100 doesn't get us very far. That $100 goes for JV and varsity, so now we're covering two teams. Helmets, um, dirt. Now we're looking at replacement belts and socks or something we replace every year. Hats you have to replace every year. You know, things like that. So the budget for that is much higher than $100 that you give us. At this point, now we're into uniform replacement. Uniforms are extremely expensive, especially if you want to purchase something that's going to last for the five to seven years that you should get out of it. So if you only spend $2,000, you're not going to get very far. It's a waste of our money. To replace uniforms, you're looking at like a $5,000 expenditure. That's one uniform. Baseball is home and away, so now we need two. Softball wears the same uniform, both home and away, so they're, they're a little bit different. You can't. You can't really take the, the money end and compare it for baseball and softball, even though they were kind of like-minded sports. Mm -hmm. That's why we get into raising so much money. I agree with you. Boosters should raise the extra things for the kids, but boosters have been forced into raising exactly, exactly, sport. right. So if you're going to have a team, theoretically, you should give those kids everything that you need to pay the sport. Now. That did not happen, and we ran into budget constraints, and you had wonderful parents who stepped up and said, these kids need to have these, these sports are extremely important, and they stepped up to fill this role. I can tell you as a volunteer, nobody wants to do more than two fundraisers. Nobody wants four or five fundraisers in a year. I mean, really, come on, we all have jobs, we all have lives, we have families. So, perfect world, I would love to do two fundraisers. Sometimes they get into three. You will rarely cool. see a team that goes into four. It's just too much work. Exactly. 
Now, as far as competing against each other, you know, we do and we don't. If you're a baseball person, you kind of have the baseball people that you go after. If you're cheerleading, you have your cheerleading market. If you're football, you have your football market. If you're band, you know, we all kind of do target different groups. It's not the same community, with the exception of businesses, and I am also a business owner. So most businesses have a certain amount that they allot for the year. So I know how much I'm going to donate for the year. If you get me in the beginning of the year or if I know you're coming or something like that, I may have money for you. If you come to me with a request and I don't have the money, I say no, I can't do it this year, but get me next year because next year I would love to help out Presley or whomever, whomever it is. So you're, you are going after the same market, but it's not a horrible thing to be asked for several things during the year. If you can't do it, you say no. Just like when a child comes to your door to ask you to buy something. If you've already purchased that ticket, you're probably not going to purchase it again. Mm -hmm. And people understand that. So, thank you. Can I help you with anything else? And thank else? you for your generosity <laughs> as one of our, our businesses in the community. Our businesses are, are very. We have wonderful businesses. We, have wonderful we families. really do. I think we have excellent families in this district. We, we, we really, really do. We really, really do. We have wonderful community members. So that's why. So you pay taxes is. as an individual and as a, mm -hmm. a business. And a, yeah. But um, that's why the fundraising it. has been pushed to a level that it has Right. And that's, that's what I'm trying to correct. That's what I'm hoping to correct in this model because I want to the district to take back some of those. They have to take Excellent. uniforms and they have to go on a, a whatever cycle, yeah. just like we're talking about the textbooks. Right. That's where I would like to move, you know, this you know, committee we and. Build in to do the volunteering to fundraise. Exactly. Like, oh, I don't, I don't not. I think you guys have been amazing. This, this You've been morphing and changing. And what I'm saying is it's, it's time to recognize that some sanity has to come back into this equation. And the numbers we ran yes. from last year's reports, yes. it would only be an additional $36,000 a year to the district to, to put in the sports budget, to be able to put the uniforms and equipment, all these things that we gleaned that they really should not have to be fundraising for, that we should be paying for. their balls, their... And it should change from year to year. Because, that's you know, uniforms? Like somebody needs uniforms this year, they won't need them next year. Exactly. Else will. You put them on a cycle. Yeah, and we're, like, for sports boosters, we're on about a four-year cycle that we give to each team some money. We can't buy their uniforms, but a little bit of money. That so they I think we're on the same page. Them. Yeah. Great. You're going, to, you're going to find what, that was really all the sports because that was obviously they had the Title IX implications, which yeah. started this whole thing. But you're going to find the uh, some of the other groups, clubs and stuff that do raise money. Uh, they're raising money for the same things. All right. Music isn't on there, but I know that part of the, the money that the kids have to pay to be in the marching band is for equipment replacement, you know, new drum heads, because mm. they'll break drum heads, they, you know, they mm. damage equipment. That's not even in this and evaluation, then you're right. And there's some, there's some cost in there like Music that. So the other groups as well need to be, you know, looked at in the same way, even though they're not, okay. you know. Okay. Like this didn't, didn't really take into account middle school, because middle, middle school don't really have booster clubs, but I can tell you right now, their uniforms are getting older, and it's going to become an issue. Like, it's an issue with middle school soccer. This right. Year. I just, I don't have Right, that's that right, because all teams for you. will but have to be on the rotation. That's going to be coming. Now, did they, so they, they, I thought they fell under. Uh, they do fall Thank under, you. they really don't do a lot of fundraising. It, yeah, I mean, there are a couple middle school teams that do, but most of them, It was, we, really we did don't. a breakdown. I, I went through, like, the last year or two and, and wrote down all the, all the fundraisers that, and broke it down by group. And I gave Ms. Mrs. Bites has a copy of that. Um, and it, I can't remember, but yeah, like one or two from yeah, the Yeah, there's, there's not much, but I think we have a. a Are, they get I some of the, uh, like, I guess they get some of the hand me down equipment. They from get the high some school. of the hand me downs from the high Obviously school. Not the yeah, get, well, they do, no, they actually do get some of the hand me down uniforms too, and some of them are pretty. Well, how, how does the middle school fit, kid fit into a high school? Not, not well. <laughs> I think basketball is wearing like Plus, if they're wearing them out. Basketball, which I think we purchased uniforms maybe if, two. If we put everybody ago. on like a four year or a three year yeah, cycle, they're going to be worn. I can we direct the. Um, seven, depending. Can I ask the, a question? Yeah. yeah. The, the students pay an activity fee? Yeah. Where, where does that money go? 
the coaching, the travel. It's general fund. It goes so, to the general fund, so it pays salaries. Yeah, and then it becomes a budget. It's item. not tied specifically to the school. I mean, I guess it goes to the general fund, yeah. So if I'm paying a, a fee to play football, why does none of that money go towards football? Well, because well, it is well, in the long what run. What we were finding is that, um, you know, for, Thank um, you. like, to say, uh, like the um, cheerleaders, very little overhead as far as you know, you know the uniform. Now they do a whole lot to go to competitions outside of that, but the cost of the district was very minimal. Right. Um, as now on the football side, their football, the football costs were actually far in excess of the hundred fifty dollars they were paying. Yeah. No, so, I get it. I get that. I mean, is everyone? Do I pay per sport? So if I play baseball, basketball, and football, I'm paying 150 every. No, yeah. you, it's There's a discount for multiple sports. And then so you get a discount so for multiple sports general. and multiple activities. And if you want to call it a discount, yeah. It's... And there's a family cap, but those, but those yeah. funds don't aren't. Well, they're getting coaches. They're getting transportation. They're getting minimal, like. Well, equipment. I think that speaks to I get you, but I mean, they are getting I something but I, for I guess, their money. Like. I can't get baseballs and yeah. Well, they do get the baseballs. Issue. They don't get enough. That's the issue here that that's we're talking the about. The team, the sports aren't getting the minimum that they need, and that's an area where the district has yeah. failed. That's where we have failed. Where we need to well, correct. That's What's the total we're... amount of revenue we get from the fees? It's like 118, 120. If I, if I had to guess then, somewhere in that, Mike, do you know? And the department budget was. Um, Two fifty. No. What, what, what they're saying, just for simplicity's sake. Um, technically, you can say it's going into the sports program. You got all the salaries and, and the benefit costs, the transportation. It's just, it's just kind of like an allocation viewed as offsetting those costs. But no, it doesn't go sport by sport. The fees can yeah. go sport by sport. Yeah, and and the budget. Tie, I don't think you want to tie the fees. No, we don't want to do that. To. No, I'm, not, I'm just that. asking. But I'm, I guess my it's not I'm enough. It doesn't like the, fund the, the, the department. The revenue that we get from the fees doesn't cover the It does not. Cost no, it is it $250,000 in the we spend athletic about department? $700,000 for athletics. And we get 100000 k And that includes like the insurance and all the, like, the busing or personal the trainer. Yeah. yeah. And all that. Athletic director. So let's start, just start thinking about the, what we heard here today and um, kick around some of that policy that I, I circulated. That it addresses a lot of the, that I will circulate if I didn't attach it. I guess it addresses just, some of the concerns, I'm just but thinking, it's not know, by any way. Any of that context, if I'm a it's a work in I'm progress. It, it bummed just, out that I'm paying whatever the fees are and I'm buying baseballs for my kid. To play I, I, I can tell They've you. Been, the families have been wonderful about it. I can tell you that we we've have begun conversations about a larger fundraiser. Working with the foundation, and I brought some of the boosters in. Were you, you were there, right? Yeah. We, we were talking about doing a large community carnival where each of the booster organizations would have some sort of fundraising set up within that carnival. It would be located at the high school and done over a course of a few days. We would take over an existing carnival that's already it's kind of waning, we would take it over. And the foundation would manage that fund, that large event, and that would be the major fundraising arm for all these organizations. So hopefully that's something that we could do. And also it wouldn't just go to our students and our families. It's a community, Berks County carnival, where we could pull in from outside of this community. Okay, because right now we're going back to the same families over and over again. This pulls in the entire county. And I don't know what kind of carnival we would call it, but it would be over the course of a couple of days located on the high school grounds. We're looking forward to that. Thank you for looking into so, that, Mr. Harris. And hopefully that could absolve some of the, yep. absorb some of the fees or all the fees, parking fees. I mean, yep. there are fees, there are fees, there are fees, there are fees. Yep. So, if this could, so if this could bring in this, this X time to number of dollars this would help with the boosters managing their money because I'm sure there are things that the boosters purchase that we really couldn't purchase through the general fund. It just doesn't work that way sometimes. Right. So they still have to have their fundraisers. Right. But if they don't have to run ragged all year long trying to get a couple thousand here, a couple thousand there, and this is their, or they tool up to this large event where their two fundraisers a year help buy the products that they're going to sell. They're going to do funnel cake because I'm really hungry right now. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> then I would buy a few funnel cakes for five or six dollars. That would be, no, <laughs> no one. Thank you. Uh, so this would be their big That's event, an exciting and this would, this would be an annual event Thank that you. we could pull off. But it's just not just Daniel Boone; it would be community wide. So I think I want to wrap it up. If there are any other comments, could you sign in, please, to remember to be on the form oh. in the back? I'm Tracy Kalenda. I live at 124 Redwood Drive, Douglasville. You're student fundraising. Am I under the impression that we're still wanting to stop fundraising during the day at the high school? I My proposal is that co-curricular fundraisers, Mrs. Kalenda is part of um, the AIDS. I'm an AIDS the And if it's, in, if it's co-curricular, if it's part of the curriculum, I don't think it would fall under this policy at all. It would be exempted well, out no, of the we, policy. We don't have to. That it would be just with the building principal and I, I, I don't like the term co-curricular fundraising because it's no. part of the curriculum. It has to be free. Now, if They're selling things. You're right. So they're, it's co-curricular sales. That's a good point, I don't right? like We shouldn't it's use the term even... curriculum. Are you talking about the cookie sales at the high school? Okay, well, let me reference. Let's make sure we use the right language. Yeah, I, that's not selling them. Sorry, go ahead. But I'm also, as a mom, as a mother of a child who graduated less than a handful of years ago, I would have been upset if he had come home and told me, we're responsible for selling 15 t-shirts. Uh, and mom, we got to sell them. And I think it's important that they have the opportunity to do it at school, that they do it, not the parents do it, mm. in as far as those type of countries. So I am in favor of the student care of that rather than the parent. Then I'm also an employee of the district, and yes, I'm in life skills, and yes, I'm talking about cookies. Now I'm talking about cookies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that those students, it's a great opportunity for them to get known and right. and it is part of the right. It's part of the instruction. I think we. I think the committee would want to leave that alone. I don't think the committee is looking to rein in anything that's part the of the instruction. The only thing that I'd want to rein How in. we word it. We have as to. long as instruction is not being interrupted. Like if I were in the middle of science class and the cookies came in and I had the option to, to stop learning science to mm -hmm. go buy a cookie, I would not approve of that. But from how I from my experience, there's was always the study hall. It was during lunch, it was in the hallways during home first period. It wasn't interrupting any course of instruction. Mm -hmm. So we have to be worried. We work. sell the cookies to have pre ordered. If, if, we, if we actually do go to a classroom to interrupt, mm -hmm. they've already pre ordered the day before. And uh, uh, in fact, we have a teacher at the high school who every Friday he has a vocabulary quiz. So he plans his class around the cookie delivery. Hmm. It's their treat for being such great students at this. And that student pre order that teacher pre orders hmm. and the They're other the store place so those are, the are allowed to sell is the out. student union. And those students have earned the right to appear in the student union. Mm -hmm. So they've they've already demonstrated that they have fantastic grades. Then the other students that we sell to actually have to have written on their hall pass cookies. And that means that their teacher has accepted the fact that this student will be walking in with a little baggie full of cookies and will be eating them, and that's okay. It's most probably their study hall. Uh, so yes, and we don't even go to study halls. The only places we go are pre-ordered cookies, student union, and if they have a pass that says, yes, they're allowed to buy a cookie at, in our classroom. And it usually happens right at the first of the bell. Thank but you. I don't know, Connor. We, I, I'm or, sure, I don't know if you ever were. We have I like the peanut butter ones. <laughs> they should could bring them to the board. That would be good. They yeah, really could sell them here, Mr. Harris. That's a good snapshot. I think they 
Thank more you. of an oatmeal Pardon cookie kind of guy. No raisins. Mushroom, however, it got so confusing and it got to be way too much. Yeah, I think yeah. I remember that transition when it happened and then when they weren't allowed. And there, I think there might have been an issue with some EXO even because they were supposed to have. Or how about the healthy lunch? Yeah. Cookie competition. Initiative. Mm -hmm. No problems with the uh, HHFKA, healthy, hungry, hungry, healthy, free kids of America. I don't know that one. <laughs> you know? But, no. The federal program? No, I don't know that one. But. National School Lunch Program. We got a waiver because they of the have, cookies. We got a waiver for the cookies. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. On the fundraising part, the co-curricular fundraising, we have an obligation under the law to provide every student with a free and fair mm -hmm. public education. So mm -hmm. we we cannot charge students to have an education. And spending money that's been fundraised is. I, I'm just worried about how we're portraying it or how mm -hmm. we did at least earlier in the meeting. Okay. We are. If a student raises money through selling cookies, they're not getting a better education. And they're not getting, or if a, a child, a student who is in the uh, life skills program, if they don't sell cookies, Ooh. their education is not being negatively impacted by that non-selling. It's just if you do sell cookies, Ooh. when you go to the store, instead of pretending to buy something, you can actually buy it if you want it. Right? I, I, I want to make sure that we're not diminishing any student's education because they may not sell cookies. That's or a they, good point. That's just have to look the at free that. and fair public, or the mm -hmm. free and uh, there's a specific legal yeah. term of art that they use. Okay. What? Yeah. Can I also we'll say that we this year we were paying for the transportation to go to all those field trips that we take to now. So, so is it like a net zero fundraiser? You raise what you spend to complete it's to all, buy the product and to. It, I mean, it's plus it's is it a net zero zero revenue neutral fundraiser? I'm not privy to that information. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it benefits I just, everybody. It benefits the people who want cookies. It benefits the life skills class, baking mm -hmm. and selling them. It benefits the life skills class, going to businesses and buying stuff. I just want to make sure that we're not disadvantaging any students who mm -hmm. don't sell cookies. And I want to make sure that we don't run afoul of any laws in terms of providing a free education. Okay. Well, let's pick up discussion on that next month, yeah. okay? Good. Any other comments? Please uh, identify yourself, sir. <coughs> Uh, Joe Gordon, 124 Redwood Drive. I heard you mention Title IX money. Now, is money coming from sources other than the state still subject to Title IX? Yes. It is? Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. I thought that was only had strings attached to it if it was came from no, the state. In, in where we kind of got in a little tangle a couple of years ago is that we had somebody very generous in the, in the community donate a substantial amount of money for football uh, uniforms. Okay. Okay. And, you know, we, the board didn't know about it. The administration said they didn't know about it. Uh, there, there's a point of contention there. But at, in any event, um, the, I don't recall exactly what the money value was. I'm just going to say between five and 10000 somewhere in there. Well, we had just, not more than three months prior to that, um, absolved ourselves from a Title IX um, accusation that was made by someone. And we had just cleared that, found out it was baseless, spent fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 defending ourselves, and then this donation came in, and it was like, all right, you know, that's, it was, the reaction was, uh, you know, develop this policy to, to kind of get a handle on that. So at least it, we won't I mean, the, the business, it up. It is, yeah, we didn't the business office from being generous and donating. Right. We just okay. wanted to know that the money's coming. At, so, like, at the end of the year, the business office has to complete a report. Yeah, and you tell us about it. With, um, uh, athletics, but yeah, we, we felt the numbers. So that's just okay. in I, athletics? I, mean, no, I think it was contrary to what I've read. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think a good question. Only state money. I think the Title IX was subject to that. Any, any it's the spending. Yeah. 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 I think the issue with Title IX is they say if you accept federal money, then you're beholden to follow. To the do the, the filings, so yes. So as long as we, right. we that's a good problem, point. we have to follow the rules. Right. For everything. If we didn't, that's, that's my understanding. So that's, that makes so total with sense. the fundraising thing, I have a little different perspective. I'm all for it. I think we should fundraise as much as we can because when it comes to sports, okay, 
There are certain kids that benefit from that, and there are certain families that benefit from that. Sports is not for everybody. Okay, sports is for stronger kids, bigger kids, faster kids, kids who can hit a baseball. It's, it's for a select group. And we as a community now, <clears throat> money comes from us to support a certain amount of kids. You're only allowed to have 20 kids on a team or whatever the covenant is. So now the whole community is forced to pay for that. And maybe my kid can't play on that team. So when you do a fundraiser, you're asking the community and you're actually getting them involved to pay for these sports. If you recall a few years back, we were cutting sports all together. And then the boosters, which, I mean, they really stepped up and they did a good job. And unless we're flush with cash all of a sudden, where we could say, let's pay for baseballs, let's buy uniforms, let's do this, let's do that, then I think we should all really think about adding this stuff to the budget because it's very hard when it comes time to say, we're going to cut sports. Nobody wants to do that. So things are going along okay now. The community gets involved. That, that was a great idea about having a carnival. And I think set the policy, use, use our new athletic director or whoever was in charge to say, here's how we're going to do it, here's how the money goes, keep it in the title line. But let's keep the community involved. And a lot of times the community loves to step up. And you'll see what's important to the community. But just to say here, well, we're going to we're going to go back and we're going to start buying this, we're going to start buying that, we're going to budget more money. I was at the last budget meeting and, you know, we got pension money. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to so do on the policy, it. I agree. embraces these people who are really considering going it and, and use these resources. Okay, thank you for your comments. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Dollar for dollar on sports. So because you spend five thousand dollars on girls, you don't have to spend five thousand dollars on sports. I just want everybody to know. If it's like uniforms do not have to cost the same amount of money, but you have to be they have to be fair. So you cannot have like, like uniforms kind. for the boys and brand new uniforms Thank for the girls. You. Perfect. Not dollar for dollar. Thank you for clearing that up. Okay? Meeting is adjourned. Seven fifty-nine.